Good morning. This morning we are continuing our Bible study here in the book of Joshua. We're going to be looking at chapter 8 this morning. Uh, Last week we looked at chapter 7, and when we looked at chapter 7, we saw uh, that right after Israel had defeated Jericho, they went into A. And when they went into this place called A, they, they were ready to fight. They thought they had so many men. They thought they had such a good number of men that they would be able to defeat them uh, uh, with just, a, I mean, that, that A had such a small number of men that Israel would be able to defeat them if they didn't send all of their troops there because God is with them and they are learning to trust in God and it's uh, a great thing. But little did Israel know and little did Joshua know that there was one in the camp who had taken things from Jericho. If you remember back in Jericho, when they conquered Jericho, they marched around the city. God said, do not take anything for yourselves from the city, but give me everything. Whatever spoil you recover, whatever gold, silver, uh, animals, whatever it is, whatever you recover, give it to me. Well, there was this man named Achan who had stolen uh, a number of items, a number of pieces, gold, silver, etc. And whenever... Um, Joshua had been defeated. Whenever Joshua and his men had been defeated at A, Joshua falls on his face before God and is like, why God? Why did this happen? Why did you not deliver them into our hands like you promised you were going to do? What is going on here? Are you, did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? Like what, what is this all about? And God tells him, you know, you need to get up because there's somebody that has sinned in your camp. You guys have sinned and I'm not going to walk with you uh, if you are, are walking in sin. I'm not going to fight for you when you don't listen to what I have to say. And they went through this whole process and figured out this guy named Achan um, was the one who had dishonored God. And when Achan had dishonored God, uh, he ended up being killed because of his sin. They stoned him and his family and his animals with stones. And then they burned them with fire and uh, they raised a great heap of stones over them because of the sins that they committed. And so uh, we we looked at that last week. And so now we transition here today. We were trying to conquer A at the beginning of last chapter. And today we're back trying to conquer A. Even though it's this little small place, they're still trying to take it. They're still trying to conquer it. And it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise and go up to A. I mean, it's easy to say, don't be afraid, don't, you know, take heart. Um, but, but after they just lost, you know, it's a little, a little disheartening, a little scary, but they found out that they lost because of sin. God is still trustworthy and that God is promising that they're going to win this time. They can have confidence because God is always faithful. God always does what he says he's going to do. He says, see, I have given into your hand the king of A, his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to A as its king, as you shall, as you did to Jericho and its king, which was they hung their king. If you remember, after they defeated Jericho, they hung their king and then they took him down at, by the night. So it says, only its spoil, its cattle, you shall take as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. And so now they're allowed to take the money. They're allowed to take the gold, the silver, uh, all of the good things. They're allowed to keep it for themselves this time. They don't have to dedicate it to the house of the Lord. They don't have to give it to God. Um, they can keep it this time, unlike Achan, uh, who had actually kept it for him when God said that it was supposed to go and belong to the Lord. Now they are allowed to keep it, but they're not allowed to keep the city. They have to destroy it. They have to burn it with fire. And so verse three, it says, Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against A. And Joshua chose 30,000 men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them saying, behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city and it will come about when they come out against us as at first that we shall flee before them. For they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say they are fleeing before us as at first. Therefore, we will flee before them. Then you shall rise from the the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it will be when you have taken the city, you shall set it 
uh, the city on fire, according to the commandment the Lord said you shall do. See, I have commanded you. And so what they're doing here is they're planning on coming at, uh, at A and attacking them to where they could see that they are clearly coming to fight. And when they see them coming to fight, what they're going to do is they're going to retreat. They're going to run the opposite direction. They're going to run away from them like all of a sudden they're afraid. They're afraid that they're going to lose the battle like they lost the first time when they lost 36 people. They're afraid that they're going to get conquered. And so they're going to chase them. They're going to pursue them. It's going to give A confidence that they're going to, they're going to be stronger and they're going to beat this army. And so they're going to pursue them and chase them and try to, to strike them down. And everyone is going to leave the city to chase after Israel because there is such a great number compared to this little city of A. And when that happens, the rest of the Israelites are going to go into the city and they're going to take all of the goods. They're going to take the gold. They're going to take the silver. They're going to take the good things and they're going to burn the rest of the city with fire. And all of a sudden, when A looks back and sees that their city is on fire, they're going to know they're defeated. And then they're going to stop pursuing, uh, or not they're going to stop pursuing, but Israel is going to stop retreating and they're going to start to fight against A while the rest of Israel can close in from behind and there will be a victory that God has given to Israel. So that is their tactic here in this battle. And so uh, verse 9, it says, Joshua therefore sent them out and they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and A on the west side of A. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. And Joshua rose up early and mustered the people and went up and he and the elders of Israel before the people of A. He did the same thing when he was ready to take Jericho. They got up really early in the morning. He was so excited he couldn't contain it. He was ready for the victory, for God to deliver victory. And here he is again. He's so eager. He can't wait. He gets up early in the morning and says, let's go. Let's do this. And so they're ready to go to battle. In verse 11, it says, All the people of war who were with him went up and drew near, and they came before the city and camped on the north side of A. Now a valley lay between them uh, and A, so he took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and A. On the west side of the city, and when they had set the people, all the army that was on the north, of the city and its rear guard on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. Now it happened when the king of A saw that saw it, the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle. He and all the people at an appointed place before the plain, but he did not know that there was an ambush against Israel and behind the city, against him and behind the city. And so the king of A has fallen into the trap. He sees them and he's ready to go. He's ready to go to battle. He's going out. He's chasing and pursuing Israel. But he has no idea that there is another troop of Israel ready to go in and to take the city. Um, He's completely oblivious to the fact of what is about to happen. And Joshua and Israel, uh, Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them. And fled by the way of the wilderness. So they're running into the wilderness. They're running away. They're they're retreating just as the plan had said they were going to do. So all the people who were in A were called together to pursue them. And they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. All of the people pursued Joshua and the men. Then people weren't staying back in the city. Even if they were, Israel had enough people to defeat them. They were ready to go to war either way. Um, But all these people left. It says in 17 that there was no man left in A or Bethel who did not go after Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. They all left the city ready to take Israel. All they left behind was their women and their children and their animals. And so they're susceptible to what is about to take place, to what is about to happen, just like that was in Jericho when they took Jericho. Uh, we talked about how hard it is when we read this part of the scripture because of the, 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 the judgment that God is bringing on the people who have not turned to the Lord, who have walked in idolatry, who have not walked in the way of God. And it's very important to walk in the way of God. It's very important for us. We know the truth. Um, and the Bible talks about how if we know that we are the ones that know the truth. And because we know the truth, uh, there's a greater judgment for those who know the truth and reject the word of God or reject the, the lifestyle of God than those who, who have no idea, who haven't heard the word of God. If you're a part of a small group right now um, and you've been doing the uh, Something Needs to Change book, you, we talk about people in the Himalayas who have never heard the gospel of Jesus, who just believe that everyone in the world are Buddhists, who believe that everyone in the world burn these candles to, 
to every single morning and, and do these sorts of things because they've never heard about Jesus and they don't know anything about God. Well, the Bible talks about the fact that we, being people that know Jesus, if we have rejected Jesus, we have a greater judgment than those who have not heard about the good news of Jesus um, and have, have, have rejected him because they didn't even know they were rejecting him. But yet there's still judgment for them because they have not surrendered to walk in the way of Jesus. And so these people are, are being judged um, and I can't tell you exactly what spectrum they're being judged on. I'm not the judge. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. But ultimately, you have to believe that these people have heard the good news of Jesus, or not of Jesus, but but of God who has led Israel out of Egypt, who is the one true God, who's made this problem, promise to Abraham and his descendants. I mean, people have, sp have been spreading word about what God did bringing them out of Egypt, about how he led them across the Red Sea. And then all of a sudden, we got these, these things after Joshua led them across the Jordan of what God had done. And everyone's heart had had fallen and failed them because they were terrified about what God was doing. And they knew that they were all going to be defeated. And so they were afraid. And so it's the same here. They are afraid because God is coming. Uh, even though they won the battle, now they got a little bit of confidence. They, these people, I'm sure at some point, were afraid because they heard the good news of God. And because they've rejected God, they are now going to be defeated um, as a product of that. Uh, judged as a product of the rejection of God and their idolatry in worship. And so it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward A, and I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city. A little bit of symbolism here. Stretch out your spear. And Joshua immediately just, you know, he's stretching out. He's ready to go. He's ready to go to battle. And so those in ambush quickly rose out of their place and ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered the city and took it, and hurried to set the city on fire. And when the men took, uh, when the men of A looked before behind them, they saw and behold the smoke of the city ascended to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on the pursuers. And now they're closing in on them and they have nowhere to go. They can't go home because it's on fire. They can't go towards the people of Israel that they were chasing because they've now turned to pursue them and they are ready for battle. And there are people coming from all directions to take these people down. And so when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of A. And the, men, uh, the others came out of the city against them. So they were caught in the midst of Israel. And some of this, some on this side, some on that side, and they struck them down, and so that they let none of them remain or escape. But the king of A they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And so they have defeated this nation. They have defeated A. Um, they have now got God back fighting on their behalf. Uh, because they are walking in the obedience to him. They are keeping the covenant and walking in his ways. They are not dishonoring God. They are giving what God is due. They are serving God in the way that they're supposed to. They uh, did what they were supposed to in the situation with Achan. And so God has continued to be faithful in his promise. Um, but there are, are many times in the Bible that God is faithful even whenever the people are faithless, even when the people are not faithful, even when the people are disobedient. Um, and that's likewise today. God is still faithful, even though uh, even though we're, we're, we're sinners, even though we make mistakes, God is still faithful. God was still faithful to send Jesus to give his life up on the cross for you and for me. That Jesus was, was faithful to die for you and for me is just such a big deal. Even though we're, we're not faithful, even though we're sinful, even though we've disobeyed God, even though we're not perfect, Jesus still loves us and Jesus still came and gave his life. Um, and God is faithful even though we are not worthy. Um, God gives grace. We're not worthy. God gives mercy. We're not worthy. But there are times in the Bible that God dishes out the judgment that is due in that specific situation. And again, I'm not the judge in order to determine what that looks like. Um, but rather, you're not the judge either. God has called you and me uh, to love, to love people in such a way that that. Uh, that we love them like Jesus did, that we say, you know what, these people are, are evil, these people are mean, these people don't like us, these people are treating us poorly, but you know what, that's what happened with Jesus, and Jesus died on the cross for those very same people that treated him terribly. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, who have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and even though we know Jesus, we still stumble, we still make mistakes, and yet Jesus still died for you and for me. 
And that's a big deal. Um, that's important. And that's the way that you and I are called to love. We're not called to be the people that judge. Now, I'm not saying that Israel did something wrong here. Don't get me wrong. God is utilizing Israel to bring about judgment. I'm just telling you for application purposes today, for you and for me, you and I are called to love people and not to bring this judgment against them, um, but rather to say, you know what, Jesus loved me, even though I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinner and I'm extremely, you know, apart from God, I, I have nothing. I've fallen short of God's glory. I am not holy. Um, I make mistakes all the time, and I need that grace. Well, so do the people in the world, and they're never going to know that love and grace of God if you and I don't show that to them, if you and I don't tell them about that good news of love and grace um, and do our best to, to listen to the Holy Spirit and to walk in a way of love, to show love to those people who are stumbling and falling in the world around us. I don't remember which verse we're on here. Give me just a second. I'm just going to start reading here at 21. I think we're somewhere close to that. But it says, Joshua and all Israel saw the ambush and had taken the city. Okay, so we read that part. Um, so yeah, we're down at 24. So it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. All the people of Ai had fallen. 12,000 people had fallen. Um, God had taken the city, had brought the judgment against them for their sins. For Joshua did not draw back his hand, which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed the inhabitants of Ai. Um, and so Joshua, when God told him to set it out, to stick out the spear, Joshua held it there. Kind of reminds me of when Moses, if you remember Moses, when God was had the people go to battle, uh, he had Moses stretch out his staff. Um, as long as the staff was up, the people uh, defeated, the people defeated the, the nation that day, whoever they were fighting against or going against. Uh, I think it was Moses. It could have been Joshua, um, but I'm pretty sure it was Moses. Uh, I think Joshua was one of the people that had to hold up. Yeah, Joshua and Aaron had to hold up the arms of Moses so that he could keep his hands, or maybe it wasn't the staff, that keep his hands raised up because as long as the hands were raised up, the people of Israel would have victory. Well, here Joshua is holding up the spear, and as long as the spear is held up, God is defeating the people of A. And so God is moving and working uh, in this, and, and there's obedience at the same time going on, following the way in the word of God as Joshua continues to hold up the spear. So 27 says, only the livestock and the spoil of city Israel took as booty for themselves, according to the word of the Lord, which he had commanded Joshua. And so Israel gets to start establishing their, their financial wealth. They're getting gold. They're getting silver. They're getting livestock to go along with that. They're starting to have a significant uh, uh, peace here, which is important. It's important for them to get gold. It's important for them to get silver. It's important for them to get animals so that they can be self-sufficient or not really self-sufficient, but you know, be able to have that self-sufficiency, so to speak, because God has provided for them. Um, and I don't know what you would call that, God-sufficient, but uh, whatever that might be, God is ultimately the one that is delivering these goods and things into their hands so that they could survive and thrive in the world as they begin to take these pieces of the promised land to inhabit. It. Now, this is not a place they're going to inhabit, uh, but rather they have destroyed it and only kept the, the goods for themselves. So Joshua burned A and made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. So no one's going to live here. It's a desolation. They have burned it to the ground. And the king of A, he hanged on a tree until evening, just as he did with the king of Jericho. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it in the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. So they've thrown him into the midst of the city to see, uh, to, and, and, and they've taken him down. They didn't want to dishonor what was going on there. Um, the commentary here says the complete execution of A's population uh, and included uh, hanging the king. The wise move prevented later efforts to muster a Canaanite army. Further, as a wicked king, he was worthy of punishment according to biblical standards. This carried the vengeance of God on his enemies. Carried out the vengeance of God on his enemies. And so 
He's saying here that because they killed the king, um, they're not going to be able to muster the kings together to grow together a one giant Canaanite army to come against Israel. But this was the way that God was bringing judgment against this king who had dishonored God by leading his people into a place of idolatry. Verse 30, Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the uh, law of Moses, which he had written. Then all Israel with their uh, elders and officers and judges stood on either side of the ark before the priests uh, and the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim, the other half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before. They should bless the people of Israel. Afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of the law uh, of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel, with the women and the little ones, the strangers who were living among them. And so what we have here is a renewal of the covenant to remember the way that God has commanded them, the, the covenant he gave to Moses in order to instruct Israel on how to live, the promises that God has given of the promised land and that God would walk alongside of them. And they do this by doing this on this, uh, this altar. But if you remember back when we read in the book of Exodus, God said you can't put a stone to the altar. You can't do anything. You can't make it in any kind of image or likeness. We're just going to make whole stone altars. Uh, we're not going to do anything to it. And so they're doing everything in, in, in uh, correlation to what God has said, keeping in obedience with the Lord. Uh, my commentary here says, thanks is offered to God for giving victory. The altar in obedience to the instructions in Exodus 20 was built of uncut stones, keeping the worship simple, uh, untainted by man's showmanship. Joshua gave God's word a detailed central place. And so as we look at this this morning, I think the overall application, the overall thing we could take away here from Joshua chapter 8 is obedience. As followers of Jesus, you and I are called to walk in obedience to God. God has given us instructions. God has given us the, the Bible here, the word of God that we are supposed to read. We are supposed to study. We are supposed to delve into in order that we can know the way of the Lord. He's given us the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we can hear what God is instructing us to or not to do. That we would walk in the way of God and we are called to be people that live in obedience to the Lord because he is worthy, because he is good, because he is faithful, because he gave himself on the cross for our sins, because we as followers of Christ have said that we have been crucified with Christ and we no longer live, but we let God live through us. And if that is the case, then we have to submit to God in everything. We have to submit to God in his word and what God calls us to do. We have to walk in the way of the Lord. We need to be faithful just as God is faithful. We should see the Lord as an example. We should see Jesus as an example. Jesus was faithful in everything, even until death on a cross, a brutal, excruciating pain uh, that Jesus had to bear, being beaten even beforehand, before he went to the cross. Jesus was faithful. Jesus was faithful to keep the covenant. Jesus was faithful to do what God had, had, had sent him here to do, what the Father had sent him here to do, because he loves you and he loves me. And if it was that hard, if it was that hard of a thing for Jesus to do, how much more should we walk in obedience to God? Even though it's not an easy thing to do, it's not dying on a cross hard. Uh, it, it's not dying on a cross hard. We might have to give up, you know, something that, that makes, uh, gives us pleasure, or gives us uh, earthly pleasure, or gives us earthly satisfaction. But it's worth it because that's what we're called to do for the glory of God. That's how we're called to live as followers of Christ. The Bible says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And that's what Jesus has commanded you and I to do. So that was Joshua chapter 8 for you this morning. Uh, next week, we'll look at Joshua chapter 9. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and close out in prayer here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word here in the book of Joshua. Uh, God, we thank you that you are faithful. 
even though we're faithless sometimes, God, even though we're disobedient at times, God, you're still faithful. God, you're still faithful to forgive our sins. God, if we come before you and confess our sins, we know you are faithful and just to forgive those sins. We thank you for that grace and that mercy that you bestow upon us, Jesus. We thank you for the gift that you've given us, that you gave your life, Jesus, on the cross, that we are forgiven, that we are free, that we have life in you, Jesus, today, even though we're not worthy of it. But Jesus, you've given us this gift this great gift, God, that we can never fully repay you for. And Lord, we pray that we would be attentive to you, Holy Spirit, as you lead us and guide us in the way that we should go in this life. Lord, we pray that we would demonstrate love, God, before all people in this world, to give grace, to give mercy, to show them who you are, God, to live out the call that you've called us to be, loving all people, Jesus, as you loved us and poured yourself out as an offering on the cross for us, God. And we pray that we would just reflect your light and your love to all people in this world, Lord. We love you and we thank you and we pray this through Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for listening this morning. Uh, we'll be back next week for Joshua chapter 9.